Welcome to the Lords and Heroes section of my Skaven guide. In this video, we'll cover the Lords and Heroes of the Skaven factions, including campaign and battle, as well as abilities and unique effects. Wretch, we wretch, we're the wretch. We pray at night, we stalk at night, we're the wretch. Disclaimer, this guide is based on my personal experience and opinions, and is by no means the definitive way to play the game in Mortal Empires. If you have a different strategy or want to add something to mine, please leave a comment down below. Now that's out of the way, let's get into the video. At the time of writing this script, the Skaven have the choice of 5 legendary lords across 5 factions. Which lord you choose will make some minor and major differences to how they play in campaign as well as battle. For the most part, I'd say the Skaven lords are pretty good, with all the legendary ones being great in battle both for melee and ranged. They do unfortunately share the same poor leadership as the rest of the roster, so if they get into a tricky situation and can't escape, then they will quickly break. The three spell laws they have access to are all decent enough and can be recruited basically from the get-go, since they can be on lords or heroes. The lords that can get mounts also have good options that will make them a powerhouse in battle, at the cost of becoming a much easier range target. They also lack any flying options which further limits their ability to avoid enemy attacks. Finally, most of the characters have a way to escape any tricky situation they get into. This can be in the form of spells or abilities that clear a way for them to make a run for it or make them impossible to track. With all that being said, let's get into the lords. First up we have Queek of Clan Moors. <laughs> Clan Moors triumphant, yes, yes. Choosing him will grant the faction minus two loyalty for Grey Seer recruits, and a percentage of all XP earned by Lords will go to Queek. His personal army will gain plus ten melee attack and plus ten percent weapon strength when fighting against dwarves and greenskins, minus fifty percent upkeep for storm vermin and clan rats, and plus two uses for the menace below. His starting army gets a warp lightning cannon, gutter runner slingers, and some storm vermin sword and shield. In battle, he's armoured and does armour-piercing anti-infantry damage, which makes him into a frontline's powerhouse. He's great at leading your units from the front and getting right into the thick of even the toughest enemy units and coming out on top. He's also a duelist, so he's excellent at one-on-one -on -one combat with some of the toughest enemy lords out there, but he can still be beaten, so it's best to keep some support nearby to even the odds. He has no spells or mounts, but does have the abilities Verminous Valor, Stand Your Ground, and Trophy Heads. Of course, when levelling, you're going to get the ever-essential Root Marcher and then the Red Tree to improve your entire army. We're also going to pick up Ancient Cunning, since ambushing makes battles stupidly in your favour and it almost negates Lightning Strike if you can get the chance high enough. The Extremely Distrustful line is also a pretty good choice for a wide range of bonuses. Warpstone Weapon is also a good idea for a bit of extra damage for Queek himself. And finally, the Yellow Tree, to make him just that much more effective with any extra points. Queek has access to two missions. The first is Dwarf Gouger, and it starts your army in the middle of two smaller Dwarf armies, but fortunately they're down a very steep hill, so it'll be slow at reaching your units and get very tired on the way. There's also a decent reinforcement army that comes in once you've taken care of most of the other units, but since they spawn quite close to you, you can pin them against the border and make them instantly retreat before long. The weapon you get is great for making Queek even more of a terror in battles, as well as providing him with an augment ability. His other mission is for the Warp Shard Armour. It starts you versus a tiny Skaven force, with some hefty reinforcements further up the map, along with more appearing throughout the battle. Taking a decent mid-game army with some fast units should ensure you take out the nearby units before they get too close to the reinforcements. The armour gained makes Queek much tougher in battle, as well as providing him with a Hex ability. Next up we have Lord Skrulk of Clan Pestilence. Lustria will fall to, to Pestilence! Choosing him grants the faction minus 50% construction cost for Pox Cauldron, Pestilent Nave and Plague Bailey buildings. His personal army gets minus 50% upkeep for both kinds of Plague Monks, Plague Claw Catapults and Plague Priests, and he causes plus 3 Skaven corruption wherever he goes. His starting army gets Rat Ogres, Plague Monks and a Plague Claw Catapult. By the way, if you feel like I've skipped over the Plague thing and some other campaign details, then they've probably been covered in my campaign guide if you want to check it out. In battle, he is technically a spellcaster, but is still a formidable melee fighter with his Plague Sensor and Frenzy ability. I find he is best used on the backlines of your battles, so that you can support your other units with spells before he gets sent into melee to do some work. He has access to the Skaven Spells of Plague, which is my personal favourite, but can do some pretty good work, so is worth using as much as you can. He also has the abilities Plague Rash, Aura of Pestilence, and Stand Your Ground. When levelling Skulky Boy, it starts off similar to Queek. We go Root Marcher, then Red Tree, then Ancient Cunning. Then we go for Loathsome Appearance line, with some great bonuses, both for Skrulk himself as well as the faction as a whole. We also want to pick up his spells, since they always come in useful in battle. Finally, any spare points can go into the Yellow Tree to improve his battle prowess. 
Skrull has access to two missions. The recovery of the Liber Bubonicus puts you against a massive undead army, but it's mostly zombies and some bats, so it's not actually as bad as it seems. Reinforcements keep coming through the whole battle, so it can easily get overwhelming if you spread yourself too thin. I think taking a lot of ranged units with good infantry shredding potential, along with some line holders or chaff shredders like storm vermin swords, would be a good combination so you can thin the herd a lot more before it reaches your front lines. The item gained will give you some great bonuses for both battle and campaign, as well as a direct damage ability. The second battle is against a fairly hefty lizardmen army, with some fast monstrous reinforcements basically as soon as the battle begins. Mid-game army should work, provided you have lots of ways to deal with large units, but this will still probably be a challenging one since you're outnumbered too. The item you gain from all your hard work will get you more bonuses for battle and campaign, as well as another direct damage ability. Ah, oh, what's this? Is this a sponsor spot? I think it is. Do you have a very long commute or a boring workplace with loose headphone policies? Do you enjoy books, but you have neither the time nor the energy to turn the page every single time? If so, then Audible is exactly what you need. It has the largest library of audiobooks, shows and dramas in the entire world. It is read by some of the sexiest voices in the world. Voices like Sir Stephen Fry, voices like Morgan Freeman, and voices like Jeremy Irons. But you may be wondering, how does this all actually work? I'm glad you ask. When you become a member, you get one credit a month which you can spend on any audiobook in the entire library and that is yours to listen to. Alongside this, you get free access to audio shows and dramas which are getting added to Audible every single month. You can also purchase additional books every month if you want and members get up to 60% discount, obviously dependent on the book. You may also be thinking, what if I buy a book that I don't like? Well, in that case, as long as you're still a member, you can trade in any book, anytime, for free so you never ever have to worry about getting something that you don't want to listen to and being stuck with it forever. You may also be thinking, well, I don't have the internet at work or on my commute. Well, that's just fine. With Audible, you can download offline and listen to it literally anywhere. They have the app and it also has a car mode, which makes it much easier to control while driving, even though you shouldn't do it while driving, get a passenger to do that, but if you have to, it's there. And finally, you may be thinking, what if I don't have enough time to listen to one book a month? Well, that's just fine. You can cancel your subscription anytime and you keep your books for life. So if you start your membership, get a book, and then immediately cancel your membership after you've bought that book, you will still have access to that book forever and ever to listen to as many times as you want. Unfortunately, you won't be able to trade in, you won't get any of the audio shows, you won't get the discounts, and you won't get any more credits. But you do get that book forever, so that's a pretty good deal. And of course, you can just start your subscription again whenever you want. The book I've enjoyed most over my entire time with Audible has to be Mythos, uh, read by Stephen Fry. It is a retelling of the ancient story of the Greek gods. Uh, it goes all the way from how they were created from the Titans, all the way to how the gods created modern, well, modern men. And it is very, it's such an interesting, modern, fun read. You get to learn who Zeus did it with. Uh, who did it with Zeus and what Zeus did it with. There's a lot of Zeus doing things with things. It's kind of disgusting, but it's a great listen. If you're not into that, then there is a huge library of every single thing that you could possibly want. There is motivational books, there's history books, there's facts, there's fiction, there's science fiction, there's probably some erotic books out there if that's what you're into. Uh, there is also a lot of Warhammer stuff. I'm currently listening to Ghoul Slayer of the Gotrick and Felix, or the Gotrick Gurnison series, and it is a fantastic listen. It's a great audio drama with all the other characters, each individually voiced, telling a great story with loads of drama and action. It's great. So if all this sounds like something that you're into, then please do head down to the description. There are two options because I don't have a actual code yet. You can either go for the free trial, which will get you one book which you can keep for life, which is completely free, or you can go for the three month 50% discount. So what that means is for your first three months, you'll only pay $3.99 per month. That is just over a 50% discount for those first three months. After those three months, it will go back to the normal price weather. So if you just want those first three months, then you'll have to keep an eye on it. It helps the channel and you get access to some great quality entertainment, so what is there not to love? Okay, now back to your regularly scheduled content. Tretch Craven Tale of Clan Rictus is next up. Chief Master of Deep Warrens! Choosing him grants the faction plus 4 public order whenever a diplomatic treaty is broken, and his personal army gains 13 melee attack during ambushes and after retreating, as well as vanguard deployments for all his units. His starting army gets death runners, a doom wheel, and some sword and shield storm vermin. In battle, contrary to his reputation as a cowardly backstabber, Tretch is actually a reasonable fighter for your front lines. He is armoured and specialises in taking out large targets with his anti-large bonus damage and his charge defence. He does struggle to take them on much since he has limited speed, but if you can get him amongst some enemy cavalry that can't run away, then he can do some pretty serious damage. He has no spells or mounts, but does have the abilities Treacher's Raiders, Verminous Valor, Stand or Die, and Stay Here, I'll Get Help. Of course, when levelling, we're going to follow the same pattern we have for the first bit of Root Marcher, Red Tree and Ancient Cunning, then we're going to go down the Treacher's Raiders tree, especially Master of Guile, which makes the ambush mechanic hilariously broken. Life is cheap is a good one too, and of course, any spare points can go into yellow. 
Tretch only has access to one mission, the Lucky Skull Helm. It sends you against a mainly goblin army with a few artillery and monster units sprinkled in there. There are also reinforcements from both sides of the map, so it's important to watch your flanks in this one. I'd say a decent mid-game army should serve you well here. The item gained grants bonuses to Tretch in battle, as well as for the faction as a whole in campaign, as well as a passive ability. Ikitclaw of Clan Skry is next up and he's really the fan favourite of the Skaven Lords and it's easy to see why. Ikitclaw, engineers, death. Choosing him grants the faction plus 20% research rate, plus 2 loyalty for new recruits, and minus 40% construction cost for all engineering buildings. His personal army gets minus 50% upkeep for Warplock Gisales, Rattling Guns and Warp Fire Throwers, as well as plus 2 recruit rank for all weapon teams. His starting army gets Doom Flayers, Rattling Guns and Warplock Gisales. In battle he's a hybrid unit since he has access to the legendary Skaven Spells of Ruin, can attack enemies from range and is a great melee fighter. There really is no bad way to use him. He is also armoured so is super tough to take out on top of his massive armour piercing anti large damage. I find it best to let him use as much of his ammo as possible before sending him into melee and of course you want to be spamming warp lightning as much as possible. As I said he has access to the Skaven Spells of Ruin and he can also use two mounts, a Doom Flayer or a Doom Wheel. He also has the abilities Musk of Fear, Brass Orb and Unlimited Power. As usual when levelling him we're going to go Root Marcher, Red Tree and Ancient Cunning. Then we're going to go down the power overload tree for some spicy bonuses there. We'll also pick up the doom wheel and any spells we're fond of, but as I said in the last video, all you need is warp lightning. Finally, any spare points can go into the yellow tree. Ikitz only has one mission, Storm Demon. It's against a sizeable lizard army with some decent reinforcements, but isn't actually too bad as long as you bring plenty of range. This allows you to take out most of the enemy forces before they even reach your lines with the reinforcements coming from a corner, it's literally like shooting fish in a barrel. The item you get grants him some excellent bonuses in battle, as well as an ability and a public order boost. Our final legendary lord is Deathmaster Snitch of Clan Eshin. The Night Lord. Yes, yes, always. Choosing him causes the upkeep for all non Eshin units to be increased by 200%. His lords never defect from lack of loyalty, and all gutter and night runners use armor piercing warp infused projectiles. His personal army gets plus 25% ambush chance and plus 8 melee attack for any embedded heroes. His starting army gets Eshin Triads, Gutter Runners and Warp Grinders. In battle, Snitch is obviously best used in an assassin that only comes from the shadows to take out specific targets rather than spending the whole battle in the thick of things. He does scaling damage meaning as his target gets weaker he only does more and more damage to ensure they're gone quickly. He also has a Weeping Blade meaning his targets are even weaker and easier to kill. He also has dodge and stalk, meaning he's also nearly impossible to get hit on even while he's taking out your key targets. He has no access to spells or mounts but does have the abilities Slippery, Concealment Bombs and Deathmaster Sigil. If you don't know where I'm going with the start of this skill tree then I don't know what to tell you because we're of course going Root Marcher, Red Tree and Ancient Cunning. We're then going down the jump scare line to improve the army in battle as well as campaign. We'll also pick up Ratfu because it sounds funny, as well as Slippery, Sneaky and Trixie. As usual, any spare points can go into yellow. Snitch has two missions available to him. Rise of Darkness is versus a moderate Dark Elf force with Malice Dark Blade backing them up. You also get a sizeable allied force at your back, but they only really slow down Malice rather than actively killing him. There are also more reinforcements once you take out the initial army in the form of a monster based army, so be sure to bring something to take care of that. It should be quite doable with a well balanced mid game army with some help from the other clan units. The item gained grants massive battle bonuses as well as a vortex ability for Snitch. His other battle is the Cloak of Shadows. It requires you to take out two small Skaven patrols before taking on some more fortified Skaven forces before finally throwing some Dark Elves at you. It should be very doable with mostly Eshin units and a lot of sneaking around with Death Runners, but you could easily make this into a Cakewalk with some other units from the other clans. The item gained grants decent campaign bonuses and a passive for Snitch. The first of the non legendary lords is the Humble Warlord. He's a straightforward fighter and is armoured and shielded, so can be very tricky to take out both from a range and in melee. He does decent enough damage and is best used in the thick of melee to support your front lines, but it's important not to let him get too singled out or he can quickly be overcome. He has no access to spells, but does have the Bone Breaker mount and the abilities Rally, Verminous Valor, and Deadly Onslaught. Onto the skills now, and everybody say it with me Root Marcher, Red Tree, and Ancient Cunning first. We'll then go for Life is Cheap along with the Bone Breaker mount as soon as possible. Sneaky and Trixie are always a good idea to go for, as well as Warpstone Weapon. Finally, Immortality is always essential for non-legendary lords, so get that as soon as you can. Next up we have the Grey Seers of Plague and Ruin. 
The only difference between these guys is the spells they can cast and a single ability, so I'll treat them the same here. They're obviously both spellcasters and really have no place being on the melee lines, so their best use is being kept on the back lines and supporting your units with spells. They both have access to the Screaming Bell, which increases their combat ability slightly, but it's still not amazing, so be sure to be careful. They both have access to the ability Arcane Conduit, and the Ruin Seer can use the Skaven Spells of Ruin and the ability Musk of Fear, and the Plague Seer can use the Skaven Spells of Plague and the ability Plague Rash. The skills are basically the same for these guys, so I'll just go over them as one. Of course, we follow the usual Root Marcher, Red Tree and Ancient Cunning, and then we go for the Envoy of the Council if we're in the early game to get those relations up, then we go for any spells we want, and of course pick up the Screaming Bell as soon as we can. Sneaky and Trixie are of course always worth getting, and Immortality is essential as soon as you can. The Warlock Master is my personal favourite non-legendary lord since he's a jack of all trades. They're spellcasters and are also pretty great melee fighters, as well as being armoured and thus incredibly hard to take down. They deal out armour piercing anti-infantry damage, so are excellent at being in the thick of the front lines, supporting your units and wrecking up loads of kills. They also have access to the Skaven Spells of Ruin, and can use the Doom Flayer and Doom Wheel mounts. They also have the abilities Extra Powder, Musk of Fear, Arcane Conduit, and Brass Orb. Leveling these guys, of course, goes Root Marcher, Red Tree, and Ancient Cunning first. Then we go for the Power Overload Tree, as well as the Doom Wheel mount and any spells we want. Sneaky and Trixie are, of course, always worth it, and Immortality is still essential. Anything spare can go into the Yellow Tree to give the Lord that much more of an edge. Our final Lord is the Master Assassin, and this guy is a powerhouse duelist and can barely be touched by anyone else on the roster, no matter if they're legendary or not. He has Vanguard deployment and is a master ambusher, so excels at starting off in a hidden location before going out and dismantling any key targets in the enemy ranks. He also has dodge, so can be incredibly hard to kill despite his lack of armour. He has no access to spells or mounts, but does have the abilities Slippery, Looming Dread, and Concealment Bombs. For our final Lord, we're of course going to go Root Marcher, Red Tree, and Ancient Cunning first, and then we'll go down the Ancient Ambusher Tree, as well as picking up Rat Fu. Sneaky and Trixie are of course always a good idea, and Immortality is a no-brainer. The Yellow Tree is also a little more enticing here, since this Lord is going to be in duels quite often, so it can't hurt to give him an edge. Moving on to the heroes, we have the regular Assassin. On the campaign map, he can assault enemy garrisons, assault units, and assassinate enemy heroes. When embedded in an army, he speeds up replenishment. As with every single hero in the game, these and every other hero increases your chances of discovering enemy undercities while they're in the region. In battle, they're just like a toned down version of the Master Assassins, so function essentially the same, with Vanguard deployment and stalk being used to sneak up on unsuspecting enemy units. They're fantastic duelists and have dodge, so are excellent at one-on-one -on -one battles and can generally come out on top, even if they're against some lords, provided they don't get surrounded. They have no mounts or spells, but do have the abilities Slippery, Assassin's Trophy, and Concealment Bombs. Now for these guys, you can either build them for campaign or battle. For campaign, you stick to the blue tree and focus on specialist and assassinate, and that's really about it, apart from immortality. For battle, you want to focus on the yellow tree and make sure they have as much of an edge as possible in battle. You also want venomous blades and concealment bombs, as well as the usual sneaky and tricksy. Casualty replenishment is always good for being in an army, as well as the usual immortality as a necessity. Next up, we have the Eshin Sorcerer, and this guy is one unique spellcaster. On the campaign map, they can damage walls, hinder replenishment, and wound enemy heroes. When embedded in an army, they provide scouting. He has vanguard deployment and stalk, so it can be used as a flanking mage in support of a flanking lord, which is admittedly a unique playstyle. Of course, he has access to the newly added Skaven Spells of Stealth, but has no mounts, and the ability is Toxic Rain and Concealment Bombs. When leveling him, it's best to go for his spells and max into anything you find most useful. Warp Fireball is never a bad idea, as well as Cathayan Training and Concealment Bombs. Scouting is a good idea to collect as many items as you can, Sneaky and Trixie are also always a good idea, and Immortality is of course essential. Plague Priests are similar to Lord Skrulk, but obviously not nearly as powerful. On the campaign map, they can damage walls, block armies, and wound enemy characters. When embedded in an army, they increase the chance of magical item drops. In battle, they're great spellcasters, so excel at supporting your units from the back lines with powerful spells, but can also do decent work in melee if needed. They may not be armoured, but they do deal armour piercing damage with their plague sensors, as well as having the added bonus of frenzy at the start of battles. They can use the Skaven Spells of Plague, as well as the Screaming Bell Mount, and have just one ability, Plague Rash. Leveling this guy is pretty straightforward. You go for any spells you want, and of course, pick up that mount as soon as possible. Scouting is never a bad idea to get more items for everyone, and Sneaky and Trixie are of course a great idea. Immortality is so much of a no-brainer, I don't even know why I mention it. Finally, we come to the Warlock Engineers. On the campaign map, these guys can steal tech, establish undercities, block armies, and wound enemy characters. 
When embedded in an army, they provide increased mobility in campaign. In battle, they function very much like Warlock Masters, but are of course not quite as powerful. They are great spellcasters, as well as dealing armor-piercing damage in melee, so are great at reinforcing the front lines whilst casting powerful spells to help your units and harm the enemies. They have access to the legendary Skaven Spells of Ruin, but have no mounts and have the abilities Extra Powder, Musk of Fear and Doom Rocket. When levelling these guys, you can go down two routes. If you're keeping them on the campaign map to establish Undercities, then all you can really do is Specialist and Immortality. If you're using them in battle, then I'd say the standardised firing drill line is pretty great for giving bonuses to the whole army. Getting their spells is never a bad idea, and increasing mobility will always come in useful. Sneaky and Trixie are of course always good, and immortality can never be forgotten. Thanks for watching this section of my Skaven guide. If you want to check out the other parts to this or any other guide, there's a link in the card and in the description for a playlist to the series. Don't forget to vote the poll for the next race you want me to make a guide for, which is linked in the description and the comments. If you enjoyed this video at any point, then please do consider leaving it a like, as it really does help out a lot. And if you want to see more of this type of video, maybe click that subscribe button to stay up to date. After all, it is free. For now though, I was Colonel Damnus, and I'll see you next turn.